been on ships like this, the Rip Pulse and the uh, Prince of Wales, I mean, it's not even practical, especially in this current, to swim. So I can see where the scooters are a huge advantage. We're going to land midship. Just imagine this midship. So from us to get here, facing a one and a half knot current, yeah. it's going to be a hard work. So having the scooter is just amazing. Almost a necessity. Yeah. Anyway, I'm going to go in first. Sure, I'm not far behind. If I hold on to your tank, I think then I can film with the other arm. OK. OK, let go. After diving the Prince of Wales, the water here on Repulse, while still very, very deep, is much clearer. We can easily see 30 meters, even down at the bottom, where we're greeted by a manta ray that swims straight at the camera, then turns and drops over the edge of Repulse, which is lying on her side. We land on what can only be described as a crater a serious torpedo hit that smashed into the starboard side. From there, we hop on the scooters for what essentially becomes an underwater taxi ride for both Warren and I. Dropping the scooters, we arrive at the four-inch gun. These were the strongest weapon that the British had to defend themselves against the incoming Japanese aircraft. Swimming under the deck of Repulse, I find something that causes my heart to skip a beat. It's a crate of live ammunition, big four-inch shells. I can clearly see the pointed projectile poking out of the end of the crate. Surrounded by other shells turned the other way around, the brass shell casing now coated in slime and light sea growth. From there, it's on to the heart of the battleship, the big guns. Repulse carried six of these heavy hitters, six 15-inch cannons. Guns that could easily sink a ship 25 kilometers off on the horizon with one well-placed shot. But against a fast-flying horde of little airplanes, these were overkill and way too slow and clumsy to even get off a shot. The big powerful elephant was dropping to its knees. 